unmuting the mic. They just told Jen and I that, so we won't say anything. It's not It's not Okay, I wasn't sure if it's a... You know, we have our nameplates with our actual names that we go by, well, and I don't want to I usually, that. I usually go by Eddie, but I go, I go by Edward half the time, too. Edward Everybody just says that. So. My husband. Very good. He's your old good. How are you? Good to see you. Oh, good to see you. Everybody in person. Nice to see you here. Good morning. 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 Good by the teachers and industry partners and we may uh, potentially need to add some more uh, before we get to August but those 
those have already kicked off. Uh, our first one was with the film industry. If you saw some of that in the paper, so um, continuing to connect our educators with industry and providing that opportunity. Uh, in July, I will um, have the opportunity to step into the role with Advanced CTE as president of their board. That's so huge. Oklahoma. Uh, so Oklahoma, we will have an opportunity uh, to tell our story yeah. about what we get to do, not only in career and technology education, but the opportunity that we have with partnerships in education of how we can work with the State Department of Education and the Regents for Higher Education and provide that whole pathway. Uh, and at CTE, we are kicking off a new strategic plan. And many of the objectives and outlines that they have there um, in Oklahoma, we're very blessed that we have um, already some substantial outcomes that we'll get to share. So um, I'm excited to, to be able to, to help Oklahoma get on the map and continue that conversation about what we can offer students. Um, we also have adult basic education. Um, one of the things you'll see your little poster um, item here as we went through the particular piece and, and went through the pandemic, our testing and students enrolling in adult basic education and GED high school equivalency, uh, we need to make sure uh, that we are helping individuals at any age back in that educational process. Um, our testing was down. Uh, we were not connecting with students and uh, being able to get them enrolled. So we have an awareness campaign for adult basic education. The QR code, anyone will have that in various locations. They can uh, hit that QR code and determine where they can go take the classes or testing. Uh, making sure that we're putting that awareness out there. We know we will have new numbers when the census numbers are official, and we get those hopefully toward the end of August of our target area. We had well over 300,000 that were identified in the 2010 that potentially would qualify and need services. Over 300,000. 300,000 would qualify. So there is work to, to be done, um, and so we're, we're trying to make sure that we have that awareness. We have some additional sites that will come on that uh, you will see some more conversation about if you are interested in getting your high school equivalency or GED, that we have opportunities uh, for individuals to connect. Um, I've mentioned the meat trailer at nauseum, I'm sure. You guys are, oh, here's the meat trailer again. It has hit the road. The mobile trailer is in training right now, uh, Tallahina is where we started so uh, it kicked off this week curriculum is ready it will move to McAllister in a few days to have uh, another training there so uh, very excited and then the American uh, Meat Processing Association will be here and it'll be a part of their tour uh, they, they helped us design that so we're excited to get that moving forward and, and, and looking for great things uh, to continue to happen with that in your packet, you will see a brochure on licensed construction careers. Uh, the reason that I put that in there, we are partnering with the Construction Industry Board, uh, specifically about awareness. I mentioned awareness on adult basic education. This is awareness on construction industries, uh, construction pathways, and jobs that are available. So this is in partnership with Construction Industry Board. Um, at their request, some specific things that they want us to target. There will be videos with this uh, that we will be providing in uh, various grade levels for the awareness and then also directly to adult populations. This same outline we are also using with our aerospace partners um, and the ACES group at Commerce to talk about the aviation and aerospace industry. So we will have some more opportunities to, to outline that. Um, and the uh, Last piece that I have, we do um, in our uh, skill centers area, um, we do, I had received the question about our programs that are at Fort Supply. We do have an opportunity to, to provide those programs at other locations, so we are working out the details for that um, as uh, Fort Supply will transition the individuals to other locations. Uh, we are hopeful that our programs that we have there at Fort Supply that we'll be able to continue to transition into the school certifications into the workforce, we just will do that at uh, hopefully different locations. So that concludes my my comments. Awesome, and it is really you know that's that's being nominated by your peers. 
nationally to be part of that board, but then to um, take on that role of president was a big deal. And it really does showcase the core high in a way that um, we wouldn't have if it weren't for that. So it really was very special. So thank you for leading nationally as well. That's right here in the state. All right, um, now let's go ahead and take our first action item, uh, which is discussion and vote on the minutes of the May 20, 2021 regular board meeting. Is there a motion to approve? I'll move. Second. Okay, we have a um, <clears throat> motion and we've got the second. Okay, very good. Any questions or discussions? Yeah. All right, let's call the roll. Ms. Smith. Yes. Mr. Hillary? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Brown? Yes. Mr. Bobet? Yes. Superintendent Hawkmaster? Yes. Thank All right, thank you. That's what you do. And now let's go ahead with uh, item number two, Mr. James. Retired to the Air Force. Awesome. Welcome. Thank you. All right, good morning again, everyone. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm just uh, really happy to be here and on behalf of uh, Janelle Stafford, our uh, chapter president for the Air Force Association here in uh, Central Oklahoma. Um, we are really happy and uh, excited with this opportunity. When Dr. Mack asked us to uh, participate in any shape, way, or form, we're, we're very happy to do so. So, uh, I need a little JT on there. A little bit about who the uh, Air Force Association is. I gave out a few handouts on that, so there's some out there. <coughs> the big picture is we're a nonprofit organization, um, lots of volunteers across the nation. Um, and we're continuing to grow and continuing to uh, push some of the things that we feel are important to the Air Force Association on behalf of the United States Air Force as well as Space Force. I think I have control. A little bit about our mission. Um, the three things that really stand out for us is the educate, advocate, and support, um, which is important to us. And the reason I'm here today is based on our education and the things that we try to do out in the community. All right, and our vision, um, again, at the end of the day, now that we have a new Space Force, we're trying to be very inclusive of them as well as support the United States Air Force and dominance across the world. I mean, at the end of the day, that is our big picture item. So, educate. Um, our signature uh, educational program is Sour Patriot. It's been around, going in its 12th season, 13th season. Um, it teaches young people how to protect the network. It's been quite successful. As you can see by numbers, we started um, <coughs> this program and it was probably about eight teams across the nation. And now we had over 6,700 teams last year. And it continues to grow. Um, as you can see at the bottom there, we are in five other countries right now. They're starting their own um, um, program under a different name, but in conjunction with us, using our material to, uh, to generate and train young people. So Cyber Patriot, you know, is that so designed that uh, it teaches young people about the importance of good security, um, network security, and cyber. I think we can attest to what's going on around the world, cyber, and the importance thereof of it. There's probably not a company in the world that doesn't need some type of cyber control, cyber protection. Uh, our partnership with Career Tech has uh, really moved the needle forward for us. Uh, as we've gotten more schools and more teachers involved, more team participation. Um, I'd like to highlight the team out in uh, Drumright, Oklahoma. Uh, in 2020, due to COVID though, they didn't get to go to the finals, but they were selected to participate in the finals. It was all done online. We were hit with COVID. It made it quite difficult to transition from an in-person training to a virtual training. And uh, I think it changed for everybody. It stopped them in their tracks and then they had to reboot and get started again. 
So they didn't do as well, but that is a team out there giving you a chance. The folks that are out in um, Drumright are doing excellent stuff with the cyber. So a big kudos to those folks. Uh, during this COVID that definitely has changed the scope of training, again, your educators in career tech have actually taken this a step forward and uh, made videos. Since we couldn't do in-person training, which is what we normally do with our Cyber Patriot training um, program, is we actually host training at Francis Tuttle on, for about 12 Saturdays between end of, well, about September to December. Uh, we would bring the teams in, any team that wants to participate, they can come by and we do training. And we do the Microsoft, um, I always forget the old three, but the three operating systems of Microsoft, uh, they will come to me, uh, that we train on, that we uh, provide to the young people. Um, typically the training is open to any team that wants to participate. So we see teams not only from career tech teams, but we also see teams from public schools, uh, private schools, some parochial teams to go up, uh, homeschool teams. And of course then there's teams from either um, 4-H clubs, we had a campfire, all girl team, and uh, we also have teams from boys and girls clubs. So um, another plus to the Cyber Patriot program is that uh, we have now extended down into elementary schools. It's not for them to compete, but it's to get them acclimated and started to think about, you know, cyber. Uh, a lot of parents, we know all these kids, we have, they, have an, they have an iPhone, they have electronic devices, they're on the computer. And we need to make them smarter about what they're doing online. Uh, we've also extended the program out to what we call cyber generations. Cyber Generations now takes a harder look at our uh, senior folks and provides them training so that when they're online, they're safe. And I'll tell you a lot of the um, career tech instructors provide that service as a volunteer in their communities by training. Uh, it can be done as a one-on-one -on -one self paced type program, but it can also be taught in a, in a group setting. Now the one that's gotten a lot of attention this year, at least in the state of Oklahoma, is our Stellar Explorer program, right? So um, introduced only in 2014. Um, we were very successful here by, we started trading in probably around 2016, but in four short years, five short years, we were able to send two teams to the finals this past year, right? <coughs> we started out with about 214 teams across the nation competing, um, dwindled down to 10 teams to attend the finals, which was all online. Um, typically, it's an all-expense-paid trip to um, Cheyenne Mountain and the folks at Colorado Springs. And the kids get to experience uh, all that we do there in space with the military, as well as a, a big um, conference on space. Um, but unfortunately, they did it online. And out of those 10 teams, we had two teams in the finals. And uh, between the folks at uh, Francis Tuttle, Purple Ducks, and our team out at uh, Edmund North, um, they did really well. Uh, the top four or five teams were probably separated between one and two teams. But as we all know, uh, the folks at Francis Tuttle are number two in the nation. You know, there are two teams, uh, you know, one team uh, out of Oregon that's number one and the third place team out of only stays in California. So we actually dominated the fair of that, that particular area. Um, you know, I was telling somebody earlier, we had teams on the East Coast, we had teams on the West Coast, and then there was Oklahoma. They took up all the center mass. So we did really well. Um, with that program, as it begins to grow, we are really starting to extend. So we've been selected as one of the uh, four locations across the country for a pilot program on stellar camps. And the stellar camps have been created to get kids more interested in space and show them what those opportunities can look like at the end of the day. <coughs> so with that being said, we uh, did some train the trainer programs, uh, excuse me, training uh, in conjunction, uh, hosted by uh, um, our folks at Career Tech, um, at Metro Tech, we had two days of training where we had some educators from across the state come in to get more familiar with the program. I can tell you that, you know, uh, space, physics heavy, a lot of science, uh, a lot of educators are sometimes a little bit intimidating. I will tell you that, you know, it's not my building work. It's not something that I am involved in. Um, but I, I'm passionate about education and helping kids do better. Uh, uh, my past life in the, in the Air Force, uh, I was a first sergeant for 10 years. Uh, that's kind of a personnel thing, taking care of people. So I'm used to, getting kids to do better. That's, that's my goal. So we are really out in the community trying to help young people you know, figure out what that direction looks like. And once you put these programs, whether it's Cyber Patriot or Stellar Explorer in front of them, they just go. The kids are very interested and they're very competitive and they're enjoying that.
Here we go. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> so this was our training trainers and the trainers that showed up. So it was, it was a good two days of training. Uh, the first day we were allowed to uh, do what we needed to do here locally. Where it's day two, we had our headquarters folks that manage the program outside of the D.C. area uh, zoom in with us, actually uh, Microsoft Teams, and conduct training with the educators. So um, at AFA here locally, one of the things that we do is we support um, food. We make sure we have enough snacks. Our training, we bring lunch, we have beverages. And, and similarly, if the teachers or educators that are coming in from different parts of the, the state uh, need some type of assistance, we look forward to helping them that. So that's why we, we fundraise as a nonprofit um, to help that out in that field. And we can provide a stipend, we can provide uh, if it needs lodging, if there's support that needs that, we're there for that. And all, for us, all this training that, that's being conducted is no charge to the participants. Uh, we don't want to have to charge teams. Typically, um, for Cyber Patriot, that's been around for a while, there's summer camps, there is a charge. Um, our summer camps that we've done here locally, we made sure that there is no charge. And, if we, and, and we've also included, again, taking care of the teachers, which is very important to us, to make sure they feel valued, because they're giving up a lot of their time and energy and finances in some in aspects to participate in this training. So with that, and I, meant, I forgot to mention, that, that train the training program is also not just going to lead into the competition, but because of the stellar camps that we're going to plan to do in July, um, as one of the uh, four locations across the country that's going to be doing the pilot program, uh, we're getting those educators prepared to host camps across Oklahoma. So we're looking forward to that. That's a whole um, new thing for us that's coming out. Um, so we partnered not only with just Career Tech, but we also included the FAA. They're going to be part of that. Uh, uh, Craig Smith out at uh, OSIDA is also going to be part of that. Uh, the Oklahoma Aeronautics uh, Commission is also going to be weighing in a little bit. So. We're looking at trying to really put a robust program together for about four or five days to really give the kids some insight into space and stellar explorers and what that looks like. So this slide is just, there you go, kind of sums it all up for us on, on what we've done with Career Tech through the years. Um, when we first started this program, again, you know, we, we would average for Cyber Patriot maybe 50 or 60 teams across the state. Um, last year we had, or excuse me, 2019 we had 170 teams. You know, 2020, again, off year, we fell down a little bit to about 75 teams, but uh, we think that that's just going to pick back up. We see the momentum moving forward, and um, so we're looking forward to that. Right now, registration is open. Uh, it's typically open between April all the way to October. Stellar yeah. Explorer, same thing. You know, when we started out, we had three teams in the state competing. Um, this past season, we had 14 teams. So it, it just keeps multiplying, and we continue to do more outreach. We continue to interact at conferences um, and, and uh, educational uh, professional development programs where we get to talk to educators, kind of give them a good overview of what that uh, training looks like. It also helps when we have those educators talking to educators. I think peer to peer works the best in getting people more motivated and involved. So I just can't brag enough about our relationship with Career Tech and what they've done for this program. So uh, the facts speak for them. I think I kind of went over everything probably a little quick. But if there's any questions, I don't want to bore you guys too much because I, I can get in the weeds a little bit. So I kept it simple. Um, and that's all I have. I have a question for you. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, stop. Uh, great presentation. I applaud your efforts and success. So congratulations. What about your um, networking, if you will, within the K through 12 as well as the career techs? Are you all just on a regular basis proactively reaching out to the schools or the districts or how does that what does that look like we so when we go to some of the uh, professional development training uh, I mean, I've been out to to Bethany schools um, we talk to educators at conferences and you know educators from K to 12 not just in the career tech system uh, there uh, one thing I forgot to mention is so the curriculum for both of these programs due to the support we get from Dr. Matt and, and Tommy Nowood that information is on their website. They, all the curriculum is there, which they pretty much give access to anybody that wants it. That's an educator. And then they took that a step further. They were able to get that uh, 
uh, approved for Oklahoma Commerce. So the curriculum in, in here can be used in a classroom setting. So it's open to anybody across the board, whether it's K through 12, uh, if it's a boys and girls team, if it's a campfire team, Boy Scouts, as long as they're in that age group and they're in, they're educated, they're in school, they're uh, enrolled in school, they can participate. Uh, and the other thing with that though, if they're a Title I, if they're attending a Title I school, there is no registration fee, it is waived. So we, we try to push that aspect of it. Um, believe me, I've had uh, multiple conversations with different schools. Um, I think the biggest challenge is that you know there are a lot of competing priorities. So the teachers are faced with a lot of different things that you know trying to you know dot all the eyes and cross all the teams. So you know whether I, I talk to them that first year or that fourth year, I think eventually it gets there. It just takes time. Yeah. If you're doing the the training is how long? You mentioned they come in on weekends, or is it a spread out over time? So the competition for say Cyber Patriot you know, mm -hmm. opens up in April. They actually um, provide some practice rounds for the kiddos to get involved. Okay. So coaches and, and then team directors can, can get their teams in there to start working on what that's going to look like for the competition. Um, the competition kind of uh, officially starts, I want to say, uh, in October-ish time frame, where it really just kicks off and starts moving forward, where there are set gates that they have to participate, they have to log into and participate in this training. Uh, so what we do is we bring them in and we start training as groups with Cyber Patriot. Uh, Star Explorer a little different. More of a high, it's a high school program that it's 100% online. So we don't have any in-house training per se. Um, we just try to support the, um, the different teams as best we can. Um, so it depends on which training you're looking at. So we would bring them in, for a while we did every weekend. And we saw that that was, uh, it was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, for five, well, four months you're bringing you know, young people and you're getting teachers and team directors and coaches every Saturday. Because we wanted, we're just we wanted to be competitive, and we thought that was the best way. But as we redevelop and continue to really work and we look at this, we decided to scale back a little bit and and, and do the training a little bit more proactively. Um, so we saw that I think that works better. But again, you know, the teams that are real competitive, we take a state like California, they put in almost 500 teams inside of Patriot every year. I mean, I think that the program is well indoctrinated in their school system out there, and that's why they get so much support. And they were very competitive. I mean, you can see by the teams whether in Cyber Patriot there's three categories: there's a general, there's an all services, and then there's a middle school. And you can see that they are very much indoctrinated with training Cyber Patriot out in California. That's one of the most competitive states across the nation. But we are starting to pick up traction. We love the fact that you know a school, a school like Drumright has been to the finals four times, which is a big thing. You know, you start out with 60, you know, 6,000 teams. And you dwindle down to about 30 teams to go to the finals. And Drum Ride has been there four times. Wow. Wow. Question uh, for you. But first, I want to thank you for being here. I've had the pleasure of be becoming acquainted with you uh, through different events as well, but was also present when Miss Norwood received the oh, award. I was on the uh, Yeah, so, uh, so that was just great to yes. see Miss Norwood being highlighted uh, by the chapter, uh, but also Edmund North, uh, uh, the student Ryan White, yes. was Cadet of the Year. So that just really speaks to that partnership with Career Tech mm -hmm. and the great things that happen when we start to work together. So much more gets done. Uh, so I just want to thank you for, for your commitment uh, to to, uh, to what you're doing, but also with Drumright. Um, what number did they end up? And in their in their conference. So, as they they do the top three, mm -hmm. then after that you don't see. Uh, so whoever wins in that category, so there are twelve teams say in the open category, which Redmond fits in, and um, they only highlight the top three teams. For second, third, and everybody else is just okay. Okay. A runner up. Yeah. So, um, but to your point, um, you know, when you look at the uh, what uh, what Edmund North and um, and uh, Francis Tuttle did. You look at those students, uh, some of those students from Edmund North feed into the career tech of Francis Tuttle. So a lot of those young people knew each other. So I had the uh, privilege of, uh, I was with the uh, Francis Tuttle uh, Purple Ducks when uh, the finals were announced and who won. And so you had these three kids, uh, four kids, who when they didn't hear their name for third place, they kind of sunk a little bit. They thought in their mind that they were the only best that they could do was third. 
So when they didn't get announced for third, they kind of went down. But then they started rooting for Edmund North because they just felt Edmund North is going to do better. And then when they got second, then the whole everything changed. But there's only four of us due to COVID protocols in there. So once we did a few high fives, it was over. So like, <laughs> <laughs> so it was quick. But to see the camaraderie with those two teams that competed, you know, they were all competing for the top spot, but they were so supportive of the other team. And the other team actually outdid them. And these guys are number two in the nation. You know? The other thing is when you talk to these young people, all of them come back and they say, you know, these programs help them decide what they want to do. You know, we had an event, um, kind of a celebratory thing. We invited the families and a few of the educators and our community partners out. We're in an innovation district um, with Katie Warren, and then we had Craig Smith come in as a guest speaker. And that, that was just to say thank you. Thank you for everybody's participation and what they did this year, um, which I kind of forgot to mention. But talking to the parents, again, the parents echo the same thing. These programs have helped my kids develop and move forward. Feedback we get from industry, these programs are helping prepare their workforce. So, you know, we, we are in partnership, again, with uh, Commerce. We're in partnership with the Aeronautics Commission. Because workforce development for the state of Oklahoma is, I guess, everyone's really priority at the end of the day. We're educating these young people so that they will stay here and be part of the workforce. We're trying to increase our aerospace. We're trying to increase our space involvement. So as we produce those folks that are, are capable of uh, being that workforce development, that's how we increase you know, what we're looking at for at the end of the day, right? to be a state that's leading in the nation, you know, whether it's jobs, uh, good paying jobs, and education. So I think it's all working. Um, sometimes I think um, we don't communicate as well as we should with each other. But that's why you know, I, I think I really um, I give a lot of kudos because, because of that relationship with Career Tech, They've invited us to so many things. And I'm retired. So they keep me more busy than when I was active. <laughs> so I'm always getting an email, an invite to this, that, or the other. And because I'm having fun, I enjoy doing it. And um, anyone in our chapter can come out and, and, and talk to this. I mean, there's a lot of people more smarter than I. I've only uh, took over these programs for like the last five years, but it's been fun. And we've grown, and we're going to continue to grow, we're going to continue to push. Uh, we'll be in Blue Jacket on the 22nd on a briefing. You know, I was joking, but we're driving three and a half hours for 15 minutes, 20 minutes of fame. So, but it's worth it, because if we can get those folks involved and get those teams and those kids, I'll get an email from a teacher that says, hey, I got one student. How can they participate? Because they're in a small location. Mm -hmm. And we, we will work and do whatever we can to help that one student. Yeah, I don't want to bore you, but. You mentioned community partners. Yes. Other than as, uh, the Career Tech Board, what can we, what can we do as uh, community partners to help? Wow. That's a good question. So we, we, off, we offer community partnerships to companies, um, um, industry. You know, uh, we, we, we submit for grants with Boeing, with North and Grumman, a lot of the aerospace industry. We submitted for a grant, grant with the Aeronautics Commission on their STEM education. So they're going to actually help pay for um, what we do with this uh, stellar camps. So again, that's how we offer teachers that availability. We know that they're taking time out of their off time to participate. Some of them may drive three or four hours, so we want to make sure that they are taken care of. And it just doesn't cost them more than they should. So by, by doing that, you can go to our website. There's always an opportunity to be a community partner. You can sign up to be a community partner. We have different levels um, to be a community partner. And there's always by donation as well. And you can indicate that you want to you know, make a donation towards STEM. And we will use it for us now. Well, thank you so much. We are so grateful for your presentation. And we do not look forward to quite a national leadership. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. So let's go ahead and. We have uh, specifically our staff update. So we had our all staff uh, meeting. We have one in December and we have one in June. So I to, want to make sure I give you the highlights from uh, our state staff meeting. We, we did, and the main thing is to recognize our employees.
things. We wouldn't be able to do all of the various things that we've been able to do without our employees. So we do have individuals who It is on. on. Yeah, it is on. Okay, there we go. If I hold it just like this, I think it will work. So I will not move my hand in this fashion, and we'll be good. So, um, so we do have some new team members uh, that have joined throughout this time period. Uh, some of them uh, did start in January, but for uh, time period, we have some new individuals who have came to the agency and uh, from various. Some of them are from educators in the classroom. Others are directly from industry, but we are very excited to have them on our team uh, as we move various initiatives forward. We do have some internal promotions, and some of them uh, you, you approved right here uh, at the board meeting. So uh, Chrissy Miller, who was our SkillsUSA state advisor, is now moved into a program specialist role. Jessica, who uh, is now the manager of accreditation, and then Shauna, which you approved at last board meeting, moving into the manager role. She was a coordinator in that area. And then Sharon Baker, who has been with us um, in the career and counseling division, uh, is moved to adult basic education. So that is an area especially for her, so she has transitioned to that area. We do have two retirements. We did celebrate our two retirees uh, with a video and appreciation for all that they have done. Guy Shoulders was in agriculture education in Delbo. Uh, he was with the agency since uh, 2015, but he has been in education well over 43 years. Uh, so uh, we the two retirees, and so we did celebrate them at, at staff meeting. Our guest speaker was Mark Perna, who talked about uh, you know, education, what that means, and the role that all of us play in that. Our excellence in customer service, here's our two individuals, uh, Connie, who is in the admin division, and then Melissa Sturgeon, which you guys have heard from in HR, uh, were nominated by, all of these are nominated by their peers, um, and, and go through a, a um, review. So uh, we are very excited. Our customer service was Connie and Melissa, our above and beyond. Uh, Rhonda works in the health division, and uh, Tracy Boyington works in our resource center. Specifically with pulling the accreditation information together and as was mentioned when we talk about workforce and labor market data uh, Tracy is the go-to for that. So they both have uh, went above and beyond for that Carrie Watkins uh, leadership and excellence. So our interactive data that uh, we talked about for two or three years and we knew it was going to be here Well, Carrie is um, help make that a reality and she also is uh, providing back training around the state specific to the data management system. And she is the manager in our information management. Our innovation award, uh, Dr. Cooper uh, helped, with, helped with the accreditation and built a new internal website for us. And then Angela, when we talk about STEM, she works in our uh, STEM division for support of our educators and different ways that she was able to connect with them and continue to expand those opportunities uh, during the pandemic. She did some really creative and innovative things, so she was recognized by her peers. And then our accreditation team. Accreditation must go on no matter uh, what challenges we have. And Jessica led her team to offer hybrid accreditation so that we can make sure that the eight schools, it was a year that we have, usually we have four to six, it was an eight year uh, for accreditation, but they found a way to not only be able to do the evaluation and have the stakeholder input, critical student input, and those particular things, whether that be virtual, they did uh, the visit in an abridged version so that everyone, we could follow the protocols and make sure everyone was uh, doing that, following CDC guidelines and so, they were able to bring those to you as board members and still hold up the very specific outline that we're required to do for that. So uh, they were nominated uh, to receive the team award. Uh, one of the other things that we did celebrate as well, uh, 1971, we were very fortunate that um, we were provided the opportunity to provide training within correctional facilities. So it is our 50th year for skill centers. So we recognize all of our skill center staff and we do have 
a, a history video that we put together uh, for you to see. And so we will show you our 50 years of, of providing. The year was 1971. The first inmate training program in the nation opened inside of the Washita Correctional Facility. This facility would later be renamed for the man who helped start the program, Jim E. Hamilton. I began to try to figure out what we could do to get, get a, the employment back in this area and also to help those that need help in the, the way of skills and so forth. I, I met with Governor Bartlett and I asked him if he would help us create an institution down here for, for the Department of Corrections. And, uh, and I, said we, I said, I'd like to try to get Votech involved to teach the courses. And that way we could have, uh, have inmates there that could learn to read and write, and get a GED, and also learn skills. There's been thousands and thousands of people come through here and people that don't have a skill, you give them $50 and a plus ticket to go to Oklahoma City when they're out of prison, they'll be right back in prison. And I think the fact that we've trained them and given opportunities for training has kept hundreds and hundreds from ever going back into, into the system because they can go out and get a job. Since its humble beginnings 50 years ago, the mission has expanded. Oklahoma Career Tech Skills Center programs are now available at 13 sites across the state. That one class has grown, and now Skill Center serve over 1,500 student inmates annually, ultimately preparing them for a life beyond bars. Cheryl Hill of Hill Manufacturing says Skill Center graduates are just what her business is looking for. We hired a young man straight out of the system and his supervisor first called me and told me that he would make me a good employee and then I talked with him on the telephone and I suggested he come on up and he's just been a model employee. That young man was Kelly Bice. Without them I wouldn't be here today without a doubt and I knew you know I needed to get into something like that some kind of trade while I was in there. Pretty soon I picked it up pretty good and I enjoyed it pretty much. I've built numerous smokers and trailers and stuff for people and you know it's just been a blessing to you know get an opportunity like that. He came with skills. He came with a good attitude. He came with a desire to want to change his life, um, make it here, and we just love him. Skill Center programs have also helped inmates buck stereotypes, really opening the realm of possibilities of what they can achieve after they're released. You know, when you have certain charges, um, drug related or, you know, with money or anything, you think you're, you're going to get out. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to have to go work at a Sonic. It really sets you up for a lot that you're not, you want, you know, your dreams and stuff, but you don't think that that's accessible to you, so. Jennifer Tiger got a desk job at M&M Manufacturing after her release. I was quite pleased when I got out and I, I followed them step by step on what they wanted me to do, who to contact, and when you do that, it's, it's a good thing, good opportunity. Stephanie Pulley, who is Jennifer's supervisor, says her experience with Jennifer and other former inmates she's hired is different than what someone might expect. They're here every day, they're on time, they're dependable, they're motivated, they're driven. Um, they're going to be our key employees that are going to thrive and excel. And in a year or two, the one employee we have now, I actually see that person being a leader, not just data entry and employee. I see that person being a leader of others. In 1996, Career Tech Skills Centers entered into an agreement with the Office of Juvenile Affairs to begin offering programs for juvenile offenders. One such program is the Cedar Canyon Adventure Program, a group home in Weatherford. Wes Warren is the program's administrator. Uh, they're here because they've made some poor decisions, but they're also here to try to get their life back together. Uh, they work on their GED program, uh, the Career Tech program. They want to learn, they want to uh, better themselves because they, they're ready to get out of state custody so they can move on with their life. And I think this program's good for that, where we teach them some job, job skills so they go back into their community and hopefully go into a construction component or 
restaurant, whatever it may be. So we're just trying to get them where they become employable. But Keith Music says this program goes far beyond teaching teens how to use tools. The, the biggest part of what we do is not the tool use. I, I tell them if they get out of this program, they know how to swing a hammer, they know how to use a saw, that's all well and good. But it's more important to me that they leave here better men. It's more important to me that they learn how to communicate with people properly, with one another properly, that they know how to, to, uh, to walk in and be professional and be courteous and, and how to speak confidently. Because I can teach them how to use tools all day long, but if they don't know how to talk to people, if they can't get in their foot, their foot in the door with some manners and some courtesy and some professionalism, then all the tool uses in the world isn't going to benefit them. A common theme you'll find in Skill Center success stories is great opportunities, not just for the inmates who go through the program, but for the employers who hire them. Our biggest asset is our people. Our biggest um, ability to create revenue in Oklahoma is employees to make parts in Oklahoma so that the parts don't get sent out to other states. And if we don't have the employees to make the parts, companies like ours are going to have to ship parts out to other states to be made. Having the program there to teach the people what they need to know allows the people to get jobs. It will allow people to make a living, not be on welfare. It'll allow the people to spend their money in Oklahoma um, for cars and housing and groceries, and it'll improve the economy tenfold. Humbled. Humbled. But thankful that we can help. They've paid their dues, but you have to be ready to accept them. You have to be ready to give them those jobs because for those who were making it on the street before, if they can't make it in a productive job, they will go back to the street and they'll end back up. So you have to make that transition easy for them. At the end of the day, it's all about changing lives and enriching Oklahoma. We're, we're trying to, to make them better men. Uh, prepare them for, for real world situations, prepare them to get a job, prepare them to re-enter society and, and be productive, uh, be positive, be professional. Uh, that's what we're trying to do. Change my life. Um, and some nonprofits who we have partnered with. Uh, Team is a nonprofit that we partner with a lot. Um, Chris Steele and his group to be able to provide services as individuals. Uh, we talked about workforce and where are we going to find them. Uh, we have an avenue and an opportunity for people to um, step into specific skill sets um, and be able to be employed. So we're, we, we celebrated uh, during the time period for our 50th year. We do have a couple of success stories. Uh, I did mention during COVID, we, <laughs> we started truck driver training um, with Department of Corrections. We had not done that before. We had our first class. We started that in July. They graduated in August, and we had our first email uh, truck driver training uh, program. They graduated a few weeks ago, and uh, they are small classes, um, and we do have to work on some of the other pieces, making sure they can get a driver's license and, and those particular things. But we do have uh, a few of those presentations as well that talk about their success story and what those look like. I'm not sure if you have the YouTube links. They're really short. Um, if you want to show those. <laughs> um, if if uh, we don't have those, then we will email those out to you so that you can see those. Uh, they are posted on our website as well. I put my cloaker down, so i got to get my hand right back in the right position. Okay. Uh, we also have employees that, that we celebrated for their years of service. Um, we have five years, uh, 10 years, 15. Twenty-five. We're not done yet. Wow. Thirty <laughs> and Whoa. thirty-five years of service. So uh, we do have exceptional staff. 
that are truly dedicated to the mission and the goals of career and technology education. So we're very blessed to have the longevity and, and the heart and the passion still making it happen every day. So uh, we do, uh, and Lisa will cover this in more detail. So we did talk about the budget with our staff where we're at. We also start having, now that 22 will be before you for your uh, proposed approval, we have already started work on 23. So. <laughs> Don't be surprised. In August, you'll get your first read of what we are looking at for 23 to make sure that we can continue uh, to move the needle in all the areas, not only that Mr. James mentioned, but uh, what we get to do in skill centers and our other delivery areas. Uh, and so now for the next 45 minutes, we'll go through that a lot. I'm just kidding. Um, for, uh, I put up here, uh, I put up here um, an outline of the things. Um, a challenge to to our staff as we were connecting virtually um, how do we find solutions to make sure during this time period we're still delivering and moving forward so uh, our staff did see the opportunities relied on teamwork innovation optimism and they never stopped and you see these uh, items that we list here are things that we have done specifically during the last six to eight months to move those forward and one of the pieces that We've mentioned uh, various avenues to this, but one of the things that, that I want to mention and make sure that you as board members have reassurance, you'll notice that the exceptional P-card audit that we had there, we did have an opportunity to have our other audit, which we already presented to you, uh, but we were notified, and Lisa and Stephanie are both here, Julie Bunch uh, works uh, with this as well. We uh, had an exceptional audit in one area. Uh, we, were, it, we were told that Everyone does have areas of finding, so we, we had one that was outlined for us, and that was specifically between the time period of March 2020 to January of 21, um, that we did not spend up to our limits uh, with the PPAR, and so we may need to evaluate uh, what the limits are. We, we also were in COVID during that time period. So, um, so we felt really good with that recommendation. Uh, P-cards, we utilize those mostly for our travel and things along that line. So uh, just goes to show our staff and their dedications to, to making sure uh, what is entrusted in us and our financials that, that they go above and beyond to make sure that they can account for all of that. So. Um, I put that up there if you have any questions about things, items that are on there. Uh, we've covered, covered them at various times, but um, we're very blessed that we were able to keep, keep things moving forward and actually add some, some opportunities for individuals. More things to come for us. Uh, Work-based learning, we will have a statewide tool that will allow us to capture that down at the school level um, and tell our story better uh, about what we are providing, the industry partners that we have. We were approved for our new website, yay! And Russell says that that is going to be available in 21. So we are so excited. Uh, yeah, fingers crossed. He's, he gave uh, and during staff meeting. He said it probably be done about October, November. I did ask what year, and he did get it done this year. So uh, yes, uh, I already talked about adult basic ed. Uh, we have morning chats every Monday morning at eight o'clock with all staff. And we have over 120 participate every Monday morning. So we're going to keep moving that forward. And then our skill centers and our facility updates that we have are, are a few of the things uh, as we look to the next six months before we do our next check. Uh, that's where we'll be. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. But just wanted to touch on our great staff, the things that they're doing, and let you see their faces. Of those, those making it happen. All right. Well, I know you also have a legislative update. Yes. Um. I quick legislative updates. Our rules. We were notified that the rules that you all approved um, at the board meeting, those have also been approved uh, through the legislative process. Uh, we did submit um, those. For the postings and we got our notification last night that they have been received so those uh, we anticipate that those will go into place in September uh, usually last couple of years it's been around September the 11th and so that's when those rules will go in place and then we will start our rulemaking process for, for the next uh, section so those were put in place 
The, uh, the legislation that directs specific professional development for educators, our professional development team is uh, designing uh, specific professional development. We are doing some of that very specifically in partnership with the State Department of Ed, and we will offer that on our platform that we started last year for them so they can uh, use it either in a group setting or if the instructor does not have availability during that time period, it is in an online format so that they can have that resource available to them. Um, also, uh, audit postings for our technology centers, we, uh, that requirement there, we had that on our site, we'll make sure that we work with the schools to meet those requirements. Uh, some other requirements as it relates to items within their uh, student handbooks, just making sure that we have the updated terminology. Uh, also, the expansion of our opportunity to work with FLEET for our high school students in law enforcement pathway so that we can offer that in high school. We already had that offered at our academies um, across the state, law enforcement academies across the state. This will help us just to kind of, as we talked about with the aerospace piece, we get to uh, have those educational opportunities sooner for young people who may be interested in law enforcement. So we're, we're excited about uh, being able to do that. And then uh, the driver's license testing, we do offer that at the uh, technology centers, most all of them are participating in that, um, and, and so that did go into uh, legislation, and, and we're very excited about that, and Representative Blum, who is sitting and, and joined us today, was a, a big part of that, and we appreciate all your work in making that happen. So, um, And then the, the last piece I have with the legislative update for the new legislation that will go in place, um, First, for the uh, Sarah Stitt Act for individuals who are transitioning out, um, we are partnering with the Department of Corrections so we can help um, meet those new statutory requirements when it comes to making sure individuals have a resume for an interview. We will partner where they need us to to help make that a reality for those who are transitioning out. So we're um, legislative process, and um, we're very grateful for our preparation that we received. Uh, we, you as a board, last year in September, re our request was to be, uh, not receive a cut, was to receive flat funding, and we were fortunate that we, we did get an increase. And so we, we are very thankful for that, and Lisa will go more in detail um, with that with that piece as well. And, and I, I mentioned Representative uh, Lowe a minute ago, he does serve on that appropriation piece for the House uh, with uh, Representative McBride, and you know, through his diligence, uh, we were able to, to see it and increase. So we thank you for that. We thank the House and Senate staff for that as well, and, and the governor. So with that, that's our my legislative update. There is a 45-page document. I'm happy to share out with you on all the signed bills and, and what our work is, um, but we did not print those for you to, uh, to save on, on some resources. So pretty good. All right, well, um, thank you so much for all of that. It was really, really great. Um, shall we go ahead and move to our action item to discuss the education budget for and receive that um, for fiscal year 2022? Very good. Yeah, This is a test. Yes, we'll see. If you have the magic. <laughs> well, good morning. Happy to be here and happy to see everyone. I don't know about you, but I'm a little bit zoomed out. <laughs> so it's good to see everyone in person today. Um, I'm here today to share with you our FY22 budget. And I believe everyone has the executive summary in their packets today. And um, I want to start off by saying, as Dr. Mack has already shared, so much thanks for the investment the legislature's made in career tech. Um, you can see as a, um, can you keep up with this? Oh. Now you go. Just oh, I know. You got to hold it like this, right? Yes. Okay, one of the first notable items is that investment the legislature made in career tech. Again, asking for nothing, understanding the economic situation that the pandemic had caused for our state as it did for many states. 
but the legislature said, okay, we see the need to invest in career tech and made that investment of $1,171,000 or a 0.88% increase in our general appropriation. So some of the items in our budget request that we said if there are dollars available, these are the items we'd like to see an investment in our system in. The first one is the statutory requirement to fully fund the Technology Center's health benefit allowance. So $805,541 is budgeted for that purpose. Next on our list of if there are dollars available, here's a way to invest in our system, was increasing the number of our, our comprehensive school programs. And we're happy to say that we were able to add 36 programs, comprehensive school programs. These are approved programs that were on, uh, they were unfunded and on a waiting list for funding. So 36 programs were added at a cost of 301916 and we were also able to add a little over 63000 to the agency's budget to support career tech programs. Our next area that increased this year was lottery appropriations, $209,203 or a 5.23% increase over prior year. Uh, the combination of that increase in general appropriation, increase in lottery appropriation, was an overall 1% increase for us over prior year. Another notable item you'll find in the budget is an increase in our Carl Perkins federal grant. It increased $706,120 over prior year. We've seen a few years now of an increase in Carl Perkins, which is very welcome. Our adult basic education federal grant also increased this year, $292,393. This is the text from the House Bill 2900 that provided us our general appropriation and our lottery appropriations for fiscal year 22. And you can see that 134,641,723 general appropriation at the top. And the next two sections, 19 and 20 of the House Bill is the um, lottery appropriation for FY22. This chart represents a 10-year history of our general and lottery appropriations. And you can see there were several years there where our general revenue was down um, due to state uh, resources availability. So there were a few revenue failures along the way. But then in 2019, there was this rebound, a very welcome rebound in the state's economy. So we had the, the year of COVID, we'll just kind of call it the year of COVID. Uh, FY21 had a small reduction there, rebounded nicely FY22 with, with the state's investment. This is another chart, another way of looking at that general appropriation history from FY10 to FY22 with $154 million and FY10 um, starting our rebound up again in, with FY22 funding. Lottery appropriation history, been pretty stable over the last uh, 12 years. This is a trend of the agency's FTE um, for the last 12 years. Uh, not surprisingly, the trend of our FTE also is similar to the trend of our general appropriations. So you can see we had a 337 staff in FY10 and we have budgeted 213.5 staff in FY22. Funding sources, where does the agency get their revenue? The primary source being state general appropriations. Almost 78% of our revenue comes from the state's general appropriation, followed by almost 17% from federal grants. And those are federal grants such as Carl Perkins, Adult Basic Education, OBAN, and TANF. 
Uh, next is revolving with almost 3% of our agency revenue. Revolving, when we mention that, that are, is primarily contracts. Oklahoma Department of Corrections contracts, Office of Juvenile Affairs contracts for skill center training programs, and also some contracts we have with schools for testing services. We also have a, a print facility included in there as well. 2.4% is funded from lottery appropriations and a very small amount, 0.20% from the agency special account. And that's an account that we have an agreement with the Office of Management and Enterprise Services, OMES, um, that allows us a conference account, basically. Charge a conference registration fee, spend those dollars in support of that conference. And please, if there's questions along the way, feel free to interrupt, this fine. Um, this is probably pretty small on the screen, but it is the first page of the budget in your, in your uh, executive summary, and I'll go through this section by section for you. First section is a comparison of FY21 revenue to FY22 projected revenue. So you can see that on the right, the FY22 revenue, $134,641,000. $723 for our general appropriation. Lottery appropriation at $4.2 million. We have budgeted revenue of $4.9 million in revolving. $29 million in revenues budgeted in the federal category and $345,000 for that agency special account for conference purposes. And it shows that comparity to FY21. The next section, and this is for all funds. All funds are combined in this um, report. This is passed through at the top. And you can see how we have budgeted the dollars that flow through our agency to our partners through the technology centers, through uh, comprehensive schools for program assistance. Um, and you can see some of the federal as well and their subrecipient awards in this area. Um, Technology Center Assistance includes their operational formula funding and that, um, what I mentioned earlier about the flexible health benefit allowance included in there. Uh, customized training, that's your training for industry programs, your TIP. Your customized and safety training is in that category. Statewide programs, that is our statewide truck driver training program. Teachers Retirement Direct Pay, this is a payment we make on behalf of the technology centers to the teachers retirement system for uh, technology center staff. Next you can see that comprehensive school program assistance. This is program assistance for our career tech programs in our uh, K-12 schools. Can I just ask while sure. we're on that? So is that 19 million the amount, the pass-through amount that pays the salaries for all of them? No, the comprehensive school amount, that is program assistance dollars for the, the career tech programs and the comprehensive schools. It also includes the salary supplement that um, those schools receive for those career tech programs. Um, going on down, you can see the lottery, and then below that are some of the subrecipient awards of federal. And that section totaling 151,834,000. Next section is the operational. And this is agency and skill center operations. This is uh, 30 million for support of our programs through the agency. Skill centers training programs are also in this category. At the bottom, you can see a category titled projected fund balance needs. These are needs of projected carry forward that we 
our budgeting to complete projects that cross fiscal years. For example, you'll see in the state general appropriation, we have 3.2 million budgeted for uh, a pre projected fund balance need in the state. That, as Dr. Math mentioned, we have some facilities upgrades that we've been going through for many years. You can kind of push those off until you can't push them off anymore. And we've had, I know you're familiar with some of our water features we've had at the agency. Um, we've, we've, we've had to address those and um, uh, we had a new roof um, on one of our buildings. Uh, this year's a chiller. I mean, there is always an upgrade that we need to make to maintain the facilities, um, as well as just some programs, projects, activities that start one year, complete another year. We have to push those dollars forward to be able to complete those. You'll also see federal grants. We're projecting $6.7 million for Perkins and adult basic education um, that is carried forward for those that we will budget to expend in FY22. And a reminder on federal, their 27 month uh, money we have 27 months from the date of um, receipt of those funds, the, the uh, award date, to expend those. And so that's part of why you'll see that carry forward always in federal, is you do have 27 months to expend those funds. Uh -oh. There we go. Um, Bottom section is the uh, breakdown of the pass-through by entity. So you can see um, $109 million um, of dollars passed through to the technology centers, followed by almost $32 million to the comprehensive schools. You may question why higher ed is on here. And they, um, through our lottery scholarships, um, those are paid to higher ed entities, as well as some of the subrecipients through Carl Perkins are higher ed entities for the post-secondary part of Carl Perkins. Then you'll see a large section that says to be determined. So these are federal grants that we're projecting carryover in but we cannot tell you exactly who will receive those awards right now. We're waiting to get actual numbers to put to that, but those are um, areas that we have budgeted to spend based on projections, but we will know exactly which type of entity will receive those funds when we get confirmed numbers. Is that like September or? Yes, or we, we usually special? try to close them out in October actually. Probably. So we have a much better, and then we revise their funding agreements and award notices with the schools and add their carryover to them. It's a process every year to do that. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sure. The next section is a little bit more detail, and this is broken out by fund of the budget. Um, again, I'll take you quickly through those categories the first one being state funding you you can see the projected revenue for state funding and then the broken down uh, budgeted expenditures between operational and pass-through and you can also see that projected fund balance need there for that um, next is the same with lottery one thing I want to remind you about lottery is we pay, we budget to spend prior year lottery in the current year. So many years ago, we, we made that change that it's better to award based on the dollars we actually have in hand, the dollars that we've actually received. So what we're budgeting to expend this year is actually FY21 lottery appropriated dollars. And a reminder also on how we allocate that with 45% for technology center equipment upgrade grants, 45% for comprehensive school equipment upgrade grants, and 10% for pre-tech educator scholarships.
Next section is revolving. So you, in this, you will see um, the skill centers. Um, Uh, the skill centers instructional support training contracts. Those again are contracts with Department of Corrections, Office of Juvenile Affairs for skill center inmate training programs, 1,568,000. You'll also see um, in under the curriculum assessment and digital delivery area, our printing operation. You'll see um, our standards and assessments. That's those are our testing contracts with schools. And you'll also see um, the meat processing certification and curriculum in that area. You'll also see the meat processing mobile lab at the top under student and stakeholder support. And that is taking the mobile lab out to the schools for their classroom. Next section is federal, and this is a breakdown between Carl Perkins, Adult Basic Education, and our other uh, federal grants of OBAN and TANF. So you can see that we're almost at 17 million with Carl Perkins. Wasn't but a few years ago, we were at about 15 million. So very excited for the direction that that's going. Um, and we have that broken down between administrative and Carl Perkins leadership in this budget for you. Um, adult basic education is broken down between the basic grant and the EL civics piece of that grant. And you can see also those projected fund balance needs for, for both of those federal grants. The um, then you can also see at the bottom the OBAN and the TANF. TANF is through a contract with Oklahoma DHS. And this just kind of ties it all together. The last page, then you can see our totals um, and see that agency special account, conference account that's budgeted for a total on that page at the bottom of 182 million budgeted for expenditure. Can I ask a question while we're still on Carl's, uh, that slide? Uh, uh, sure. On the total Carl Perkins, or just help me with this, the projected new revenue is 16.9 million. Yes. Okay, so how do we get, is sort of like carryover? Okay. Yes, we're the, at, the two million. Total. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's the projected carry forward that we will need to Got budget. It. Yes. Okay, August 15th. Got so, it. Yeah, yes. That makes sense. How do we get that part? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Good question. We also have the same thing with adult basic education, okay. where we have projected carry forward there. I have a question on the Carl Perkins, uh, that increase of 706 that you mentioned earlier, is that also already included within that projected new revenue? Yes, yes it is. Uh -huh. Yes, it's included in that $16.9 million. Very good questions, any others? That was very thorough and I'm grateful for that. I do have a question on that very first one, just kind of going back to, to the start of your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, with 2020 and in that area, can you speak to those, um, you can say those COVID dollars and the American Rescue Plan and all of those um, that came through for the state um, and how, you know, career tax and what they've received. Is any of that included in any of, the, obviously this is the budget, but, uh, but was there any help that came down to career tax? No, well, career tax did not receive any of those funding from the CARES Act and the American Rescue Act, Plan Act. The, Our the, state agency did The not. state agency did not. Uh, technology centers, because they are approved as post-secondary, um, post-secondary accredited, they were in the formula uh, for their adult students who, on the 
detailed calculation that they did, uh, technology centers had the opportunity to receive those directly. They were required to spend 50% of that on their student, and then they have requirements on what they spend. But as far as our our agency, we we were not allotted directly any uh, CARES or uh, rescue dollars. So all of this is specifically on funds that we already um, had the avenue uh, to receive those. It's a great question. Um, do you anticipate with any kind of infrastructure uh, federal bill, seeing any kind of support that would come through to directly uh, we we have had uh, various conversation of uh, especially in the aerospace um, if there's a way and we tie it directly to workforce uh, where we may be able to partner in that um, with with other entities that's one of the avenues of conversation uh, so we'd love to have that president of CTE advanced yeah. <laughs> yeah. you'll be lobbying <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll be educating individuals on the importance of yes. providing that infrastructure yes I also want to recognize Stephanie Rosander. She's here today. She's our finance manager, and she spent many, many hours putting together this budget for you today. How do we do on the 27 month spends? Do we get, do we do well on getting that spent? Yes, we do not send money back to this. We spend every dollar. <laughs> With the exception of P cars. Well, you know, well, yeah. we need to kind of up our game on that. Yeah, I'm just. <laughs> I'm just but this this well, last slide is just a, a little tighter summary of, of just what I think of. Are there any other questions? These are good questions. So we send money to certain uh, career techs, right? Yes. Out of our budget. Mm -hmm. Are we in arrears to any of those schools? No. And some get more than others, right? Okay. Based on need or um, what they I'm apply for. Our, our state um, technology center operational formula. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's many components that go into right. that formula to determine the amount that would be for each technology okay. center. And they apply for those funds they every year they submit information to us so the information they submit to us is what is used to determine their amount for the year okay the, uh, mr. Brown the basic calculation is their local income minus um, expenditure and then that's where it would fit into uh, their dollar amount that they receive so we have approximately three to four that do receive more state appropriation than what they have local because of their their local um, revenue that they can obtain so that it is based on on the need in that particular area but one of the things that is constant is that health benefit allowance so that piece is not through the formula that piece uh, being statutorily required that is why uh, you will see it every year in our appropriations so that the request is so that we can meet that piece because if we do not get that health benefit allowance we have to reduce it out of their program dollars so um, and, and uh, same thing with our, our business and industry uh, dollars that they receive at the technology center that is based on performance so the number of companies that they serve uh, retaining and contact hours all go into the formula and we run that for them every year okay. thank you mm -hmm. the it was called unfunded request for some of the additional funds went to is that based on that initial uh, I guess the annual request they make or is that they do special programs and request funds? So each year they, they submit a cost report, um, what their uh, local revenues are and all those particular things. We update that. Uh, Joanne uh, DeWall does an exceptional job of keeping that updated for school and then uh, it's on a three year. So if they have a really bad one, it doesn't, I mean there's a three year uh, piece there uh, and then we take the allotted dollar amount that we have and then apply that across the board. Okay. Uh, so as to your question, Mr. Brown, if there were other things that they could ask for, yes, if we could put more dollars into that formula piece for them, then uh, it goes directly to the, the program. Yeah. 
conversation. Um, I saw on their um, an, an item for a grant writer. Yes. Is that filled? Yes, yeah, we have right. an individual okay. outsource. Such work. an important person. <laughs> Just right like now, say enough. Writing and grant for um, skill reentry at the skill centers for lighting. Great. Right. Okay, then board members, um, if there are we had adequate opportunity to make a determination on motion, we'll entertain one. Motion to approve is there a second? So second. Legislature who are deep in the numbers, um, they're on the back row. <laughs> so, I appreciate that. All right, well, are there any amendments? Uh, in your packet, there is the outline for summit, the registration for summit. If any of you would like to participate in any part of our annual um, summer conference, let us know and we can get you registered for that part. Um, it will be a a very cool and sunshiny day that you get to walk to various events. So we can connect you with any part of that, or if you would like to speak to any of the um, tenants for any of the educator groups, we can connect you. Just let us know. John McPhee. Yes. That's going to be held at the Civic Center? It is uh, downtown at the Convention Center I mean, in Oklahoma City. I mean, the yes. new Convention Center. Yes. yes I'm sorry. Uh, and then we do have various venues. That is our, our prime location for the main uh, conference. Mm -hmm. And we do that in partnership with OKACTE, um, our vital partner in many things that we do. Um, and our, they are our partner in, in some of you said uh, we'll be walking around. I mean, is it some of the meetings may be back at uh, a couple of the hotel venues? Oh, um, I see. And, okay. and so, but it is an opportunity to see over 4,000 career tech educators. That new army is pretty nice, too. Very good. Thank you. All right. Then, uh, is there a motion to adjourn? So Thank you. All right. All right. All right. All right. We can do that in person. Yep. We can do that on Zoom. Um, so with that, we are at the table. Thank you. Thank you.